my entire outlook to the law and to the importance of the rule of law, the importance of equal opportunity, is immensely shaped by this picture of my father in 1952 standing by the side of the ship, lost and lonely, and trying to see whether he could possibly have imagined that 60 years later, his son, who had yet to be born, would be the chief justice of this place. I can remember walking with my mother to the market and her being robbed, literally robbed, by someone who came with a knife and plucked a gold chain off her neck. I also, however, remember that within three days, and I kid you not, within three days, the policeman came to our house and we had a little marble table outside in the, uh, in the little garden that we had. And I remember sitting there with my mum and the policeman had a, a, a fist full of gold chains. He must have had 30 gold chains. And he put them on the table and he said, is yours there? And I remember my mum found the one that was hers and they knew it was hers because they knew where the others came from. And that tells you something about law enforcement, police authorities, and a commitment to try and make sure that rights and, and expectations were fulfilled and were honored and were respected, and there was a real commitment to try and do that. Um, law has historically been seen as a profession, and what do I mean by profession? I call it uh, a, a group of people pursuing a learned art in a spirit of public service. That was the famous definition that Dean Roscoe Pound gave. And it's a definition that I really like because it emphasizes several things. But the most important thing it emphasizes is that we do what we do in a spirit of public service. And I think if we lose that, then society will be much poorer for it. I think that the courts play an immense role in preserving uh, order and peace and stability in society because the pressure that any society faces in terms of order and stability is when the human heart is unhappy. And when the human heart is unhappy, it looks for outlets. And the courts are vital in uh, providing a trustworthy and honest outlet that satisfies most people in order to uh, keep stability. So that, I think, is the biggest challenge because um, we are going through a period of frightening change. Frightening change. That pace of change will cause a lot of tension in society. And we are a very vulnerable society because we're small. We have uh, different racial, religious groups. And to the extent we have been successful, we've been successful because as a nation, there is tremendous trust in our institutions. But you can lose that trust without intending to do anything wrong. And that's my biggest challenge. How to make sure that the court remains that voice for trust, that voice for legitimacy, and that voice for authority. One of the things the Charter was meant to do was to push ASEAN, which was very successful politically, to more of a rule-based uh, system. And it would be interesting for us to hear your take. What do you understand by a rule-based system? And why was that such a, such a centerpiece for the Charter, which at least symbolically towers over all other ASEAN instruments? I think that the rule of law should be seen in all nations as being in the enlightened self-interest of governments and states. And I see the rule of law as a powerful, powerful um, uh, enabler and framework for development in nations. If you talk about a genuine commitment to alleviating poverty, alleviating hardship, I think that 
at the foundation of that is a sincere and genuine commitment to the rule of law. But I think that for the region, as a lawyer, I think the biggest challenge will be for the whole of ASEAN, all the ASEAN countries, to really embrace this um, uh, uh, belief that the rule of law is foundational to ASEAN and foundational to our community. And really to make this rules-based commitment a reality, not just a theory. I think if we can achieve that, it'll be wonderful for, for the whole region. There is a serious problem of non-compliance, not of dispute settlement. It's a Pacific organization. And empirically examined, most of the non-compliance is at the administrative level. Yep. Government officials, not ministers, not parliaments, not uh, how, how they collect the duties, what forms to fill in, etc. And there I said, why not take a different approach and yes, use no constitutional amendment, use the established principles which exist in all our countries for judicial review of administrative action, and claim that an administrative decision without compelling reasons which brings the country into violation of ASEAN obligation is unreasonable and can be judicially reviewed. It was one of the highlights of the conference. We had three judges judging the uh, panel. Myself, the Chief Justice of the Philippines, and a judge from Thailand. So you had one common lawyer, one civil lawyer, and one hybrid system, Philippines. You had three different lawyers, three different legal systems, judging an identical problem. But when we sat down and analyzed it with just these two principles in mind, what does the instrument set out to achieve? Can we reasonably interpret the domestic law obligation in a way that would be consistent with and advance that intent? If we just applied those two principles, we all came to the same conclusion. You interpret your domestic laws as far as reasonably possible. It's because courts really don't have a reason to go through their work assuming that governments intend to breach their international obligations. In fact, the far more natural assumption you want to make is that governments will adhere to their international obligations, and if they have passed some legislation, it's not a big leap to make the assumption or apply an interpretation that advances that.